Thailand and Australia share a long and special friendship, from the earliest diplomatic exchanges to today's extensive cooperation. This friendship was deepened greatly in the 1970s, when King Rama X spent six and a half years in Australia, chiefly at the Royal Military College of Australia, Duntroon. But the seeds for that visit were planted eight years earlier, when the then King and Queen of Thailand came down under the very first foreign royals to ever visit Australia. The interest taken in Australia by the royal family of Thailand was, the, at that time, somewhat of a first. Welcome to the King and Queen of Thailand. In the past, you call Thailand or Siam a country in the Far East, but our country is not the Far East. It is the Near North. This was a focused visit to see whether it would work that His Royal Highness the Crown Prince would get uh, the right elements of what his mother and father were hoping for. Uh, out of such a, uh, an attachment. That focused visit paid off, and a few years later the attachment began, with the Crown Prince landing in Sydney for a year at Australia's oldest private school. We were told one day at assembly in the house that uh, a new boy would be coming. He was the Crown Prince of Thailand. I was rather uh, in awe of him, uh, you know, this was the first of uh, any kind of royalty that I've ever met. The Crown Prince came to board in MacArthur House and I was one of the boys who was asked to uh, welcome him and um, uh, ease his uh, integration into the school in, uh, in 1970. Here was a boy who um, was new to Australia and uh, new to boarding school in Australia. And really, he was like uh, no other new boy. I mean, he was treated exactly, exactly the same. Writing for the school journal, the future king wrote, The word Australia is no longer just a word, but brings up memories of gum trees, wattle in bloom, dust, floods, suburbs, outback mineral resources and Australians. The thing we really resonated most for me was his interest in the arts, particularly music. His father was a great musician. We would sit and listen to the King play. And that, that was something that we both loved and never, never lost. I always said to my friends at the time that he would be the King, he would be a strong King, and he would have the confidence of the army. And so began the future king's next Australian endeavour, a gruelling four years at Australia's prestigious training ground for military leaders. For any uh, youngster going into the Royal Military College of Australia, otherwise known as Duntran, uh, it's a daunting prospect. You're being yelled at marched around, uh, you know, been thrown all these uniforms that you have to work out how to wear. It introduces young people to, to discipline, it introduces them to an understanding of themselves, uh, an understanding of others. I began there in 1972, uh, straight out of high school, and uh, had no military experience uh, other than a year or so in cadets. So it was entering into a different world. You all arrive, then everyone's a, they're like a grey mass when you first arrive. And then people say, oh, do you know that uh, the Crown Prince is here? It was probably in the mess uh, one evening uh, when I, I first met him. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, at the time, wow, uh, th this guy is here with us now. What a shock it must be. Then we sort of realised, oh, no, he's one of us and he's here to do the program with us. We were exhorted to treat him in exactly the same way as we would each other. So it was very important that he, he not be seen as being set apart, that he be part of the team. 
when we did PT, when we did drill, when we did weapons training, uh, he was one of our class, one of the cadets, and uh, these were the requirements, and he was doing all that. We used to do endless numbers of heaves to the beam and push-ups and so forth. His Majesty could do a lot more heaves to the beam than I could, I can assure you of that. You can't be a, a junior leader in the Army if you're not fit, and you need to be out there all the time. It was a great challenge for all of us to maintain the necessary levels of physical fitness. Um, the senior cadets were always keen to remind you that you needed to continue working uh, to get a better result. That obstacle course is actually, it's a very good example. Um, it's, it's a simple but a very good example of inculcating teamwork. Okay, where you go. Military work's all about teamwork. A lot of our, our work is built around small teams, uh, being given leadership opportunities in those small teams. I remember being up there in the wee small hours of the morning, going around at first light, practicing with my small team of four. I'll move it through. There was a competition each year to get the teams over in the quickest time. And of course, if you left one behind, then you're a washout as a team. So the, you must get all four people over the obstacle course. And uh, you saw in that film clip a very good example of the teamwork that that was generating. Now, it's very simple, but it does translate into a bigger and more sophisticated picture later on in life. Come on, pull it. It's really getting to know yourself, uh, understanding your limits, and, um, and understanding how to relate to other people. Every morning we'd go out here and there would be an inspection, so your gear would be inspected and they would see whether your boots had been shot up during the night and whether your uniform was properly pressed and so on. Drill was a huge part of our FERT, particularly in the early days, um, that is of any military institution. Uh, it, it has a long history, there's a cultural dimension to it of course, but basically it's to instill discipline. You have to perform as an individual, but you perform within a structure, a culture, an expectation of subordinating self to the needs of others. Drill is all about uh, standards, self-discipline, being able to exercise command and understanding command at a certain level, but it gives you the ability to uh, be confident in yourself, your bearing, how you carry yourself. And so there's lots of fine things about just not just going left, right, left, right. For the first three years of your life here, a four year course was overwhelmingly academic focused. We were both soldiers and scholars. You could not pass Duntroon and graduate if you did not pass your university degree. The idea was to create in those days young men of both action and contemplation. So you would spend five days a week doing your academic work uh, and then maybe one afternoon a week and certainly on Saturday mornings you'd be required then to do military training and then squeeze your study in for the rest of the weekend. It's hard. It, uh, it demands high standards of you. It demands that you learn your limits. Indeed, that limits uh, may be uh, far higher than you expect. You know, you, you can actually achieve more than you think you can. At the back of your mind, you're always aware that this guy was going to be different. He was going to end up being the monarch of his country and uh, he would be a king one day. He could be with us during the day, but during the evening he might have to go to the embassy for a particular function or activity, national event or a celebration, and play a completely different role. He had, in, in a sense, a number of lives running in parallel. So he had a cadet life, but when he stepped out of Duntroon into the Thai community, it was completely different relationships. The rest of us didn't have to do that. Uh, we didn't have to change that way during the day. So I think that was a big challenge uh, and, a and, and you learn and grow through that experience. In our final year, um, when we did uninterrupted military training for 12 months, we moved into air mobile operations, operating with helicopters. 
We are being introduced to new technologies, uh, new um, new techniques. Um, you know, every day was uh, was exciting. We travelled all over Australia, of course, as a class to go to these various um, periods of training. Of course, you re re receive theoretical lessons about leadership, but it's really going into the field and practising it, so it becomes instinctive, and uh, and you put your hand up for the hard jobs. You must accept that the lessons you are learning could end up as life or death decisions that you have to take when the training's finished, when you're out commanding your troops and the chips are down. We were required to qualify to call in artillery fire and in fact one of those clips you see there is uh, myself and the, uh, His Majesty pouring over the firing tables of, a, uh, of an artillery piece. It's quite a complicated issue, it's, uh, it's fairly mathematical. Nowadays of course it's all been revolutionised by digitisation but in those days it was very manual. It really is giving you that practical experience that brings all those other the skills you've been putting together into that actual activity. You do get task focused, you do get very driven and, uh, and you develop a really strong work ethic out of this. Well, it's an unforgettable day. Two sensations go through your mind. One is relief, I've made it. And the second was, wow, what does the future hold? This is exciting. By the time you finish, you've ticked a number of boxes that say you are a capable, competent, skilled person who is able now to go and lead in the army. We all had our families here, our mums and dads and loved ones. It was terrific that he was able to do the same, to have his mother here. That was quite special, albeit she was the queen. She, of course, came onto the parade ground. I remember the ceremonial reception for uh, Her Majesty, and she was welcomed by the then Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser, and, uh, and Mrs. Fraser. We were very conscious that uh, the Thai nation, not, not just the leading family, but the whole Thai nation, were placing a lot of trust in Australia for that period of time. But we embraced the opportunity his Royal Highness did as well, and I think a fine young man left Duntroon at the end of that four years. It was always in the back of my mind that what he was doing here was preparation, that we were here to start a career. He was here in a slightly different way. He was here really to prepare himself for what was, was to come. His Excellency, the Governor General, will now present the Royal Commission of Rank in the Royal Thai Army to Corporal Wajira Longborn Mahadol. We were delighted. It had been a wonderful success. A lot of hard work by His Royal Highness, but he was embraced by his classmates and did splendidly. It's worth stressing that he was one of us, you know, he was one of the team. He looks back on that now, I know, thinking that this is pretty special.
His Majesty's experience in Australia provided a strong foundation for the relationship between Thailand and Australia. And the continued personal involvement of the royal family has contributed to the development of the relationship at many levels. The relationship has been strengthened by the many exchanges and visits by members of the royal family. His Majesty returned to Australia in 1999, coming back to the Royal Military College during his visit. And Her Royal Highness, Princess Mahachakri Sirinton, and Her Royal Highness, Princess Chulapon Krom Praksisawankawat, both visited Australia again in 2019. From the Australian side, the then Governor-General, Sir Peter Cosgrove, attended the royal cremation of His Majesty King Bumi Ponadulyadet the Great in 2017. The Thai-Australian relationship is now deep, wide-ranging and based on mutual respect. We are friends and partners. We look forward to an even stronger future together. <laughs>